going on there uh, in that family. And yes, yes, uh, keep growing the church. Keep growing the church. I like it. Uh, it works. Uh, okay. Um, at the end of service, uh, I'm going to ask everybody to please not jump up and take off. I need your ear for literally two or three minutes, but it's very important. Very important what I have to say. So please uh, just, I want to make sure that we uh, do some things before I make the announcement. So um, uh, let's get started. Let's get into Ephesians. We're on page 26. Okay. Uh, remind you, we're talking about uh, the prayer uh, that Paul has uh, for the Ephesians, uh, the church here at Ephesus. And if you remember, he started off uh, letting us know uh, a couple important things. Um, and, and remember, the first prayer of Paul in Ephesians in chapter 1, if you remember, it was what? It's on the board if you need help. You, his prayer is about you in Christ. Now he has the second prayer in uh, this book, in chapter 3, and of course, it's about Christ in you. And the first thing that he starts to, to, to talk to us about, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, was that our inner man would be strengthened by his spirit. I want you to notice, and I'm not trying to be funny, I'm not trying to be that guy, I'm just, hey, at the end of the day, if the Bible's our authority, let's let it be the authority. Yeah. Are we okay with that? Are we okay? Is anybody else not okay with that? I mean, we got to be okay with that. Because if we're not okay with that, then we become our own authority. And I just think that's a dangerous place to be. Uh, I really do. Uh, but, but notice he doesn't say anything about our outer, outer man being strengthened. He's talking about our inner man being strengthened in uh, the spirit. And then number two, he talks about how Christ needs to dwell in our hearts by faith. And so let me read verse 14 again. I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to read to the end of the chapter because hopefully we're going to get through most of that today. But it says this, Paul says, uh, Ephesians 3, chapter 14, for this cause, and we're going to talk about what this cause is at the end of the service today. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the rich of his glory, all right, here we go, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's the first thing he's, he's saying. I want you to be strengthened in might by his spirit. And then number two, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Why? That you may be rooted and grounded in love. Why? That you might be able to apprehend, or not apprehend, comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. I do think it's interesting, four dimensions is the world we live in. That's interesting. It's almost like somebody in the Bible knew something before it ever got really made known. And to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow. What a prayer. Now unto him that's able to do all that he just prayed for us about, uh, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask of th or think, according to the power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And that's where all the church should say, Amen. Amen. Because that is the purpose of the church. If we're going to get to verse 21, we've got to do verses uh, 14 through 20. I would argue even some uh, the four other points he made earlier in the chapter, which we'll, we'll hit on uh, at the end of service. So, so listen, we're talking about this thing. Uh, I'm on page 28. By faith. By faith. The, uh, there's no other way. There's no other way. You can't do this. You can't do this by sacraments. You can't do this, now hear me, you can't do this by song. You can't do this with feelings. Yet, I do believe that is the push in today's church. Aren't we pushing feeling? Aren't we pushing the importance of 
song in our service, and I'm not saying there's not an importance to it. We've got to just make sure we put the right importance to it, not the wrong importance. When singing takes over the service and becomes the main attraction to the service, now we got a problem. And that happens in a lot of churches this morning. They're going to spend more time, effort, money, smoke machines, lights, all that stuff to get you in the spirit, because that's how we get you in the spirit, play songs, that's how we do it, than the Word of God itself. I mean, listen, man, I don't know about you guys, but I listen to services. I listen to what other churches are doing, and I'm not trying to, I'm just telling the truth. Like it, dislike it, whatever. When you sit there and you listen to 45 minutes of music and then 10 minutes of a message, something's wrong. That ain't right. Oh, but did you feel the Spirit moving today? No, I didn't feel the Spirit moving today because the Spirit doesn't move in the music. The Spirit moves in the Word of God. That's Bible. That's what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say the Spirit moves in music. No, the Spirit moves in the Word of God. We've got to get this right. What does our faith have to be in? Well, how about we not let Pastor Frank tell you what it has to be in? How about we just let the Bible tell us? Well, what does it say? Well, in Colossians 2, it says this, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Can I be spoiled with philosophy and vain deceit in a song? Yeah, you could. But is that what, do you think that's what he's referring to here? After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ, I think we could probably nail this as hard as we could. What does Romans ten seventeen say? Faith cometh by hearing. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the music you play. Is that what it says? No. no. It's by the word of God. So what does, what is Paul saying here? What does he want our faith to be grounded in what does he want this faith to be uh, 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 that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith what is he what is he referring how is Christ going to dwell in our hearts by faith by the word of God there's no other way folks if you can find scripture to show me then please do but I'm just telling you man there's no other way and the reality is, if we're being real with ourselves, and, and we can easily point the finger at what other people are doing, let's point the finger at what we're doing. Let's just make sure we're getting it right. Because if we're not getting it right, then it really doesn't matter if everybody else isn't getting it right, because we have nothing to do with everybody else. We've got to worry about what we're doing. How many people leave their... Uh, how many of you did a Bible study this week and you were in the Bible? Don't raise your hands. I'm just asking. How many of you pick up your Bible and read it on a daily basis? How many of you take the time to learn and teach someone else the Bible. See, that's a big one right there, because I bet you a lot of us ain't doing that, if we are in it. This is how our faith grows. There is, well, I pray, Lord. I pray. Pray is not, praying is not going to grow your faith. Praying is you speaking to God. God doesn't speak to you in prayer. You say, whoa, 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 pastor. Yes, he does. It's that inner spirit thing going on. Yeah, the inner spirit only speaks through the word of God. He speaks to you through the word of God. Now, if he speaks to you in prayer, it's going to be in remembrance to the word of God. That's how he talks to us. That's why it scares me when I hear some of these people. You know, these prophets, these, these apostles running around churches going, well, God came to me and this is what he told me. Oh, really? Did he? And then it's completely contrary to what's in the Word of God. Hey, I prayed about that, Pastor. I prayed about that, and God told me it was okay. Even though it's in, contra in, in, in contradiction to the Word of God, God would say it was okay for you. Well, who becomes the authority there? You want to know what the problem is? And I don't want to get hung up on this. I, I, again, I'm just, hey, I'm just that guy who always takes the thought and brings it to his logical conclusion. Here's my problem with 
thinking that God can speak to me in prayer outside of that book. Here's my problem with it. I can make God say whatever I want him to say. Well, I really want that house. I mean, I know God is not opening up the door for me to get that house, but I really want it. And I know that I went to God and he told me it's okay. Or, or, now I'm going I'm to step on some foots right now. I'm going to step on some foots right now. Or, hey, we need a need, we need a, we have a need in the ministry. We need you to do this. Okay, pastor, let me pray about it. What are you praying about? Are you a part of this church? Is the need there? What's there to pray about? Well, yeah, you know, Pastor, I prayed about that. I just don't think that's right for me. Oh, really? Could you show me in Scripture where it says that's not right for you? Because we're all supposed to be doing the work of the Lord. Now, if we're asking you to do something outside of Scripture, hey, have at it. Book, chapter, verse, Pastor, why are we doing that? I'm all for it. I got you. But there ain't a thing we do in this church is we don't have book, chapter, verse. We, everything we do is based on book, chapter, verse. We're going to see that very, very well uh, uh, at the end of service today and going into uh, chapter 4. Everything we do is based on Scripture, especially found in Ephesians 3 and 4. Um, so there you go. Okay? Listen, uh, when you do this, when you... Uh, 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 Get uh, uh, that when Christ dwells in our hearts by faith, when you do this, you begin to build roots as you are getting grounded in it. Hello, Psalms chapter one, with the tree that was took root into the ground. Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's almost like, isn't it interesting that God? Uh, has this similitude. <laughs> How about that? There we go. He has this similitude of men as trees. Well, I wonder why he does that. Because he's trying to teach us something. But a tree can get chopped down, can it? Be careful. And what do you do with a tree that gets chopped down? You throw it in the fire and it burns. Hello. It's almost like God's trying to tell us something. When they built the tabernacle, they built it with what? Anybody remember? What kind of wood that was called? What was that all about? Because the wood represents flesh. How about that? And you need to nail your flesh to the cross. You got to love the book. You got to bow to it. You can't argue this stuff, man. God knows what he's doing. And he knows the perfect similitude for every. Did I say every, Robert? Did I? Every situation. And he gets it right every single time. But listen, when you plant a church, uh, not a church, uh, when you plant a tree, you can't just plant the tree and walk away. Hey, planted. Have at it. You're good. No, that tree needs what? It needs water. It needs the sun. <laughs> y'all, y'all getting this? What does the sun represent in the Bible? The sun of righteousness? Huh? What does water represent? You got to wash with the word. I mean, it's almost, it's almost, what am I going to say? It's almost like God wrote the book. Yes, he's trying to explain something to us. We need to be rooted and grounded in it. Rooted and grounded in what, Pastor? The Word of God, because it's the Word of God whereby we grow. I just quoted a, 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 a passage in Colossians, if you didn't know. That's how we grow. That's how we are established. That's the way it works. This, this root will grow into something much more magnificent if we let it. Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation Shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? By the way, does God say you ain't going to have any of that? No. Did, did God say you ain't going to have any of that? No. no, what he said is when you have that, who's going to separate you from Christ? Because all those that live godly might suffer persecution. No, 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 no. Paul says they will. Because it's coming. If you're living godly, 
persecution is going to come. If you're talking to people about Christ, persecution is going to come. It's just the way it is. But nothing's going to separate us from the love of Christ. He talks about in verse 18 how he wants us to comprehend, to comprehend with all saints these four different dimensions. Uh, uh, Philippians 4.12, uh, Paul says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Wow. And by the way, I want you to notice there's nothing wrong with being full. There's nothing wrong with being hungry. There's nothing wrong with uh, 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 suffering or need. There's nothing wrong with any of that. It happens, okay? But the point Paul's making is, but I'm instructed how to do it right. Anybody else okay with that? Uh, th listen, that, that's, the, that's where the mature Christian needs to be. It's not that you have money. It's not that you don't have money. It's not that you have this or you don't have this. It's not that you, you, you uh, um, have food or you don't have food or, or what type of food you eat. What, it's none of that. It's just be instructed on how to handle with what you have. And does what you have have you or are you, what's, what, what's, what's the Bible say? What's the word? Content. Or are you always looking to have more? You always got more, got to have more. You know, that's our society in America today, and I think it's what's keeping us from a real life in Christ. We're too busy worrying about wanting more. And once we get the more, got to have more. And once we get the more, got to have more. Well, why? Well, because my neighbor's got it. Oh, because that makes sense. Because that's what the Bible says. No, it's understanding how to be content. How to be instructed to live with that which, by the way, unquestionably God gave you. Are you living under the means of what God gave you and doing with that as he has instructed you to do? Make sense? So, so the first thing he says here, let's talk about these four dimensions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you guys do uh, some reading on your own there with other stuff. We could definitely get into all that, but I don't want to bog us down. But the first thing he talks about, is you're filling the blank on page 29, it's breadth. Breadth. Not breath. Breadth. Breadth. Not breath. That was my fault. I noticed that. I, I, that was, that's the reason why I messed up up there. It's B-R-E-A-D, not T-H. Got it? We're not talking about breathing. We're talking about breath, space, okay? Uh, uh, listen, what I want you to notice about it is, is that uh, uh, we're not just talking about the land in Israel. We're talking about the love of Christ, the love of Christ does not just work in the land of Israel. Now, in the Old Testament, that's where, because things were physical in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. We're talking about something greater than this now. We're talking about the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, the breadth of God's love is infinite. Amen? Yeah. It's infinite. It's, there is no limitations. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy uh, 2, 4 through 6 says, Who will have how many to be saved? Okay, let's try that again. How many men be saved? All. All men be saved and come unto the knowledge of truth. That is God's will. That is what God wants. And now, if God wanted that, and if God willed that, then couldn't God do that if we're talking Calvinism? If, l l let me repeat the question. If God wanted all men to be saved, and if God wanted all men to come to the knowledge of the truth, if Calvinism is true, could God do that? No. Of course he could. If he wanted to make everybody be saved, and if he wanted to make everybody come to the knowledge of the truth, he could do it. 
But you see, the problem is, God has given us all a choice. Do you buy what I'm saying now? Do you understand what I'm saying? He gives us all a choice. So it is his will that all men be saved. It is his will that all come to the knowledge of truth. But not all will. Because not all will make the choice to do so. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. Listen. But there's one God and one mediator between God and man. Who? Not Mary. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying what the scripture says. What does it say? The man. Not the woman. The man, Christ Jesus. Because Mary didn't give himself for all to be testified in due times. Who gave themselves for all to be testified in due times? The Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus. Listen, the breadth of God's love, there is no limitation. All men can be saved. All men can come to the knowledge of truth. But not all will be saved, and not all will come to the knowledge of truth because they reject it. And there's, there's a major problem that a Calvinist has in these verses right here. You've got to do something with that because that's what it says. I read John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Now, it doesn't say like our ESVs like us to think. It doesn't say, for God so love the elect. That's not what it says. Even in the Greek, that's not what it says. So I don't even know how you're getting there. No, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, that's a choice. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that not a choice? Yes, it is. It's a choice. But the breadth of God's love is given to everybody. Remember the man on the ground? Remember what I said last week? Who could pick up of the manna? Anybody could go pick it up. It was there and available to all. But what would happen if you didn't go pick it up? But it's there. It's not God's fault that you didn't partake of it. Y'all, y'all, y'all with me on that? Length. The length. This talks about the long suffering. And listen. It's the long suffering of his eternal purpose. That's what, see, most people don't understand what he's long suffering for. They just look at that and go, oh, yeah, he's long suffering. Yeah, yeah but you've got to follow it to his conclusion. Long suffering for what? What is he long suffering for? Well, because one day he's going to put his son on the throne and he's going to sit there for eternity. That's what he's long-suffering for, and he's giving us more and ample amount of time to allow for as many people of the whosoever to get there. But you want to know who has the, uh, the great privilege of helping people get there? Pull out a mirror. You've got to be a woman to do this right now. Pull out a mirror and look at it, because it's you. That's how we... God's long suffering for that eternal purpose. And you and me are the sole way he's going to use to get there. That's how we get there. The mystery of his will is fulfilling his eternal purpose, which, by the way, was before the foundation of the earth. Amen? 1 Timothy 1.16, Paul says this. He says, how be it? For this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a you see that? For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe in him to life everlasting. Paul was a pattern to who? To every single person. Do you know that the reason why you're sitting in that seat right now today is because somebody told talked to you about Christ? Anybody? Am I wrong? The reason why you're sitting in the seat is because somebody opened their mouth and they shared with you the message of the gospel. Well, if you want somebody to sit next to you that has that same story, you need to open your mouth. I need to open mine. It is, it, it's the pattern. Paul was very adamant about the importance of this. How long has God been long-suffering for? 
Well, could I suggest since Adam? And could I suggest take that in? All this time, all this time, the sins of men have been filling up those vials. Hey, what are you talking about filling up those vials? Now, if you were here when I taught through Revelation years ago now, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Revelation chapter 16, 15 and 16. Those vials are being filled up with the sins of man. And one day, God's going to unleash the vials of the sins of man on planet Earth. And prior to our salvation, our sins went into those vials. You understand? When God unleashes his wrath, man, take that in and just think about it for a little bit. We're part of the reason. We're part of... I I don't want to over-dramatize what I'm about to say, but I want to make sure we get it. When God unleashes his wrath on this earth, we are part of the reason why that wrath is being unleashed. Do you understand that? Because until the day you got saved, your sins were getting put into those vials. I don't have time to go through and walk you through how Scripture teaches us that. But if you were here when I taught that, you know that what I'm saying is right. Our sins, prior to salvation, were put into those vials. And one day, God's going to unleash them on planet Earth. Now, we might look at that and go, that's terrible. That's awful. I would say you're right. That is terrible. And that is awful. All the more reason why we need to make up for it now and do something right on earth. Tell people about Christ. Preach the gospel to Christ because our sins is what's going to destroy this earth, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is what's going to save it. Anybody okay with that? Hey, it's important that we understand and know what we need to know. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slacking concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish. Okay, I'm not trying to be funny again, but Mr. Calvinist, what are you going to do with that verse? If he's not willing that any should perish, then and it's his choice who he picks and chooses who gets to go to heaven and who doesn't, well, then nobody has to perish. If he doesn't want anybody to perish, there you go. The problem is people are going to perish. Why? Because there's a choice. And he's long-suffering for it. He, He would, the Lord would, that all should come to repentance. But will all come to repentance? No. No. Height. Height. Uh, We learned a little something about this height in Ephesians 2, 6, and 7. And this is why I feel like sometimes I beat the the drum over and over again. And I'm sorry, folks. I'm not trying to be that guy, but I'm trying to let us in on the importance of this stuff. Listen, part of the love of Christ in the length and the height and, and, and the, uh, the breadth, and, and now the, 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 this height that we're talking about. Uh, listen, do you remember what it said in Ephesians 2, 6, and 7? And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. When? When did he do that? Now! Now he did that! Remember when we talked about that back in Ephesians chapter 2? We are, right now, we're seated in heavenly places with him. I can't explain that. Have at it. Have fun. Trying to figure it out. All I can tell you is, that's what the scripture teaches. We're there now. So if we're there now, how can we forsake that here? This is why being in church is so important. It's why it's so vitally important. Because if we forsake the assembly, what we're forsaking is the breadth, the, 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 the uh, depth, and the, and the height, uh, 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 and the length of God's love. He, he died for this. He died for this. How can we forsake it? And what we don't understand is that when we forsake it, what we're doing 
What we're doing is we are affronting against him. I, I'm not mad if you don't come. <laughs> I, pr I promise, Robert, am I mad when people don't come? What do I say when we talk about this? What do we both say? We just love you guys, man. And what we're doing is we are hurting individually. We are hurting Christ. He died for this. This is his. I didn't die on the cross. You ain't going to affront me if you don't come. Do you understand what I'm saying? But listen. Please hear what I'm about to say. Hear it with a pastor's heart. Understand, I am not trying to drive stakes into people. I am not trying to get... I'm not. But I am trying to be real and be honest about some stuff. We have, what, 15 months left? 16 months, something like that? We are at the critical junction of the future of this church. What happens in the next 15 or 16 months is going to determine the direction of this church for the next five, maybe even 10 years. I want you all to understand the reality of it. I'm not trying to drive a point home. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm, not tr I'm just trying to get us all to understand. Can I ask you a question? Let's say I have a business, okay? And let's say I have uh, me and two other workers. Now, my objective in my business is I want to grow my business. Yeah? And wouldn't that be the result of our businesses? We want to grow it, right? Right? Yeah, we want to we want to get bigger and, and, and be able to serve more people, right? So that more people can can uh, uh, be affected by the work that we're doing. But on top of that, so that I get back in return, right? Is that is that is that the American way? <laughs> okay, but I want you to know that's God's way too. But He just isn't concerned about people's money. He's concerned about the souls of men. Okay, and listen now. Get this now. Now watch. This is important. Pay attention. But if I got a business, and I have my two workers and me, and I don't have anybody else that I can hire because nobody else is willing or wanting to do what I need them to do, how much can my business grow? I got to be careful. I don't want to overwork my people. I don't want to be overworked. I can't, I can't do that. So I got to be careful about how big I grow. Right? Now, if, oh man, we trained that person up, we trained that person up, we got that person over there, they're all in over here. Oh, hey, I got 15 workers now, I can grow my business, can't I? Yeah. Oh, I got 30 people now, I can grow my business. Maybe, now you know that maybe is the right word, I'm just using it for the sake of our church, because I'm going to tell you right now, it's not maybe, it's absolute. The reason why we don't grow like we could, is because we only got half the people doing 90% of the work. And God isn't going to bring more people because he knows that this church is all about discipleship. He knows that, we, that, that we're, that's what we do. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just being honest. about Why would he grow us to put more on the plate of people who are already doing it, that already are overstretched, do you think God would do that? He can't do that. No. I've told you. I'll tell you a hundred times more. This church will only be as good as the weakest link. It's just the truth. And until the back side of the church starts doing what it is God's calling us to do, then the front side of the church is just going to be running themselves into the ground. It's just the truth of the matter, guys. And if you don't believe me, you might really want to go read 1 Corinthians 12 and really read what it says. Because it's exactly what Paul's talking about. The Corinthian church was failing at what they were supposed to be doing. Why? Because members of the body of Christ weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing on the back end. And I'm just telling you, man, I don't think that this church doesn't grow because we have a tough message. No, I think there's enough people out there who want this. They want this. But God's not going to draw them here if we have nobody to work with them. Why would he? he? He can't overextend the people that are all about it. And so when we have an all-night prayer of a church of 70 and 15 people show up, then we wonder why. We're just kind of straggling along. 
and we have discipleship and only half of our church is involved in it, well, then we wonder why. And we have things where we do things, you know, our Thursday night service, I'm just being honest, guys, I'm just being, Thursday night was pathetic. 70 people in our church, 70 people. And we didn't even have half the people of our church there. We were less than that. And that's fine. If that's the way we're going to roll, that's fine. Just know, guys, but we're not going to grow that way. That's not the way this is going to go down. If we're not going to submit to, uh, what's that first word? Add to your faith. If we're not going to submit to virtue, then what's God, God's just going, what's the lesson we learned last week? 1 Corinthians 10. God, God's long-suffering, but y'all know what else God is? How long y'all want to walk in the wilderness for? Hey, I'm with you. And I believe God is with this church. God hasn't let this church go away. We're still here. I believe he is with us. But I also believe not all of us are carrying the weight like we should. And I just wonder, and I mean this with all, just hear me with a pastor's heart. I'm not trying to down anybody. I'm trying to help us get this, man. I just wonder what would happen if all 70 of us we're on board and doing what we were supposed to be doing. I just wonder what would happen. I have a feeling this church would grow. I just had that feeling. You want to know why I have that feeling? Because God's word says this is what will happen. Are we okay with that? Did I offend anybody? Did I upset anybody? Because I'm not trying to. Are we okay with what I just said? Because it's true, guys. We're only going to be as good as our weakest links. And when I say weakest link, I don't mean you're weak. I mean you're weak in the faith. You're not doing what God has called you to do because, yeah, you know, there's just other things in life that are just a little bit more important. And I don't mean that ugly. What I'm saying to you guys is, listen, you know, it's one thing when you don't know Ignorance, biblically, it's not bliss because we all are going to get held accountable. Okay? Whether we knew or not is beside the point. It's in the book. We could have known. Okay? So ignorance from a, Christ, from a Christian standpoint, it's not bliss. Okay? But, but it's one thing when you don't know. If you don't know, you don't know. You don't know to do something, you don't know. Okay? At least I can go, well, they didn't know. God's not going to say, well, they didn't know, but y'all, y'all see what I'm saying. It's a whole nother thing when you do know. And I just wonder, I just wonder what the accountability for that will be. Y'all been in this church, man. Some of you have been in this church a long time. We know. I, I think we, me and Robert and, and the men that got up in it, I think we have shown you the scriptures to prove it time and time again. Yeah? yeah? Maybe? Yeah. Okay, okay. We're going to be held accountable to it. And Jesus does say something about that. It'd be better <laughs> that you had not known than to known and not done. Tie a, tie a noose around your neck, he says. And I mean, Jesus gets serious about that stuff now. You want to know why? Because, man, if every mouth is going to be stopped, could you imagine it being stopped because you did know? I mean, hey, if my mouth, if my mouth was going to be stopped, at least let it be because I didn't know. But if I did know, oh, man. Oh, man. That's why, man, I'm just telling you, man, what I learned over in Africa, we are very, very sadly, sadly not close to where we should be. This church does a lot of good things. Don't let me get that. Don't let me mistake in that. Don't let me say that wrong because we do do a lot of good things. But we cannot just rest on the things that we do good. We have to look at the things that we don't do good and we need to get better at them. That's called growth. And if we don't start getting better at some of these things, well, hey, what are we going to be? Just a dead church? Because we're not growing anymore? We might be growing in the Word, but if we're not growing thereby within, then what's going on? Y'all understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I hope nobody's offended what I'm saying. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm just being honest. I'm trying to speak to you for a pastor's heart. I'm trying to tell you, hey guys, we've got 15 months left. 
There's a lot of people doing a lot of good things in this church. Praise the Lord. Please keep doing it. We need it. Don't get frustrated. Don't, get, don't let the devil do that to us. But, and I'm praising the Lord. For, but then there's some people in this church, let's just be honest, that man, they just come to church. That's really all they do. And I'm not telling you to leave. I'm telling you, hey, man, come on. Aren't, don't you want to be a part of what Christ died for? Come on, man, let's go. We got work to do. And if we could get the others to get on board with the, what the others are on board with, oh my gosh, what we could do. Now, not for one Baptist church, Jacksonville. I could care less that our name gets made known. I, I want to make his name known. Amen? We, we all should want that. But man, we got to do it together. It's the importance of all of this. And I just have this thinking for feeling. This thinking feeling that the reason why we don't grow like we probably could is because we're not. There's a schism in the body. There's a schism. I shouldn't... We were talking about uh, the prayer thing there. You, you want to know what I'm going to do this time? This is sad. I even have to do this. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to put a list in the back with the four different time slots and I'm going to have you sign it if you're going to come or not. So that I know who's coming and what slot. Because I don't know about you guys, but I'm telling you right now, when you're there for three hours and there's three people there, that's a hard three hours. Do you understand? What, what the heck, man? What is more important? Are you telling me that coming together and praying as a body is, is, is wrong? No, I think I can throw you scripture that tells you it's right. Come on, man. What are we doing? And by the way, and again, I'm not trying to get on anybody. I know it may sound like I am. I'm just trying to go, hey, man, we got to get right here. We, got, we do some great things. But there's some things we don't do so good. We got to get better at them. Not for me. Not even for you. For him. Because yeah. <laughs> he deserves it. Yeah. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Is it a living sacrifice to be here at 3 o'clock in the morning to pray? Yes, it is. But we need people here at 3 o'clock in the morning praying. Yeah. Anybody? See, the people that are saying amen are the ones that are here. I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just trying to say, come on, man. We got to be better. Do you believe in this book or not? Do you believe in his promises or not? Do you believe he's coming back soon or not? Because I believe he is. I believe the time's short. What are we doing with it? What are we doing? Well, you know, Pastor, man, I work all day Friday. I'm tired. Then come at nine. I don't care. Come on, man. And don't just come. If you're, if you're going to come, open your mouth and pray. The Lord wants to hear from you too. Come on, man. we got to get better at this stuff. And praise the Lord. I think our Saturday outreaches are getting a little better. Praise the Lord, but it can get better. Could you imagine if we could double that? If we could have more? Come on. All it takes is just coming once a month. Man, if half the church came once a month and half the church came the other time of the month, wow. Wow what we could do. Y'all hear me? You, you, I mean, I'm not, I hope you don't think that I'm bragging on you. But listen, man, you know, it's like I tell my son and my daughter all the time. I'm going to love you when it's time to love you. And I'll tell you I love you. But man, when you do something wrong, I'm going to tell you you did it wrong. I'm going to tell you you did it wrong. I'm going to tell you you need to do it right. Because I don't want my kid to think that wrong is right. Because that's the society we live in. That's the problem with our kids today. They don't know the difference between wrong and right. They don't. And I don't want my kids to grow up like that. I want them to know the difference between wrong and right. And when they do wrong, I'm going to let them know you did wrong. Right? Right. Right? Yes. But, but when they do right, I'm going to reward them. I'm going to reward my kids for doing right. So listen, man, don't you think that's what God does to us too? <laughs> maybe, 
maybe this pastor that's sitting up on the pulpit right now that seems like he's trashing us right now, maybe this isn't my words. Think about that for a little while. Maybe God has laid this so heavy on my heart that it's just time that I need to say something. And why would, and why would God lay it on my heart? What did I tell you? If you can't go to the Word of God to prove it, well, could I go to the Word of God and prove everything I've just said? Yeah, yeah I could. We got to get better, folks. That's all I'm saying. We don't have very much time in this building. We gotta, we're going to come to a place where we got to figure out what we're doing. Man, we just got to get better. Why? Why do we got to get better? Because we need to understand the length. We need to understand the height. We need to understand the breadth. And we need to understand the depth of God's love. How deep was the Father's love for us? Well, just take a look at the cross. That's how deep it was. Amen? Amen. And listen, but, but, but in that depth, it's not just knowing something that's going to make us different. It's, it's allowing God, Christ, who dwells in us. Remember, that's what the chapter is all about. It's allowing Christ, who dwells in us, to do His work in us. There's a depth that the natural man cannot and refuses to see. They can only see the surface material things. But man, if we want to know the deep things, what does 1 Corinthians 2.10 say? But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Uh, over in page 31, we need to know the love of Christ. Man, I don't think we have to go very far than Romans 5.8. For God commended His love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Amen. Oh, come on, guys. Amen. Come on. Amen. 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 Listen, for the love of Christ constraineth us. Does the love of Christ constrain you? Because we thus judge that if one man died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. And rose again. And listen, I know, I know that what I'm saying to you guys is going to require death to self. I know that. To take a Saturday out, to, to, to come on prayer night, to, 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 to be here on Sundays, to make Sunday worship and Sunday uh, uh, coming together and, and Thursday night, to make all that a priority. I understand what I'm asking you to do. I get it. But we still need to do it. That early church, man, go read it. Day by day. I wonder how much their all-night prayer services went for. I'm going to bet you it probably went longer than 12 hours. And you want to know why it probably went longer than 12 hours? Because they probably had 2,000 people there and you had to give time for everybody to pray. I'm just saying, guys. What? What? What are we doing? I don't want to be a church that just plays it. I don't. And if that's what we're going to be, then oh, oh, okay, I'll still come up here and preach because that's what I've been called to do. And Robert will still come up here and preach because that's what he's called to do. But man, we could do so much more. Yeah. And God could do so much more through us if we would just yield to him. And just let's just start with the simple things. The stuff that we know we, know we should be doing. Amen? Amen. Anybody? Amen. Listen. This is why the law is no use to us. It's your fill in the blank there. It can never extend to the depth, height, uh, and etc. to God's love. We're told to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. As you learn what Christ did for you when you were bearing your own burdens, you will naturally have someone else in, uh, and naturally walk in the Spirit. Somebody else is... Uh, uh, in mind, right? Because he's in you and you are in him. You do not just know him, rather he knows you. There is something the law could never do. That's why 
James tells us, actions speak louder than words. I love Jesus. I love him. So thankful for Jesus. Well, if you were thankful for Jesus, then wouldn't you be doing what he called you to do? I, I would think there has to be something that comes along with that. There has to be. Page 32, it says, be filled with all the fullness of God. Colossians 1, 10 and 11 says this, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. How are we to be filled? How are we to be filled? Well, we're to be filled with knowledge. Romans 15, 14 says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with, how much knowledge? All knowledge. Able also to admonish one another. Pastor, man, come on, move on. Is it okay that I admonish us right now? Huh? Man, if we want our knowledge to gain uh, uh, in, our, in helping us in our growth. Man, we got to understand what we're doing wrong. That's the Bible for you folks. Three quarters of the Bible is telling you what you do wrong. I mean, I love God's Word. Well, then you should love being told when you're doing something wrong. I don't like that. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. You want to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God, you've got to know what you're doing wrong. That's the only way you're going to get right. Yeah. See, we're opposite in the church today. We want three quarters of, make me feel good, pastor. Every now and then you can throw in that sin word if you want. But, but, but man, make me feel good. No, no. The Bible's a mirror. We need to look into it and we need to ask ourselves some serious questions. Are we really being all that God's called us to be or are we faking it? Let's not fake it, my friends. We need to be, we need to be filled with knowledge. We need to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, And be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Amen? Hey, we got to be filled with the Spirit because we can't do this on our own. The Spirit's the only way we're going to get to where God wants us to be. I can promise you right now, and I'm not saying any of you are, I'm just making a statement. If any of us are offended at what I've just said here a little bit, you're not filled with the Spirit because the Spirit won't be offended by this. You want to know how I know that? Because Psalm says it. Anybody know the verse I'm talking about? Huh? And if they are in the Word of God, right? You won't be offended. Yeah? Don't be, if you're offended by what I just said, man, maybe it's because you're not filled, being filled with the Spirit right now. Maybe your flesh is allowing to dwell up in you a little bit. I know none of you are offended. Philippians 1.9 talks about uh, the love of, uh, and judgment. Paul says, In this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Oh, but you Christians, man, you can't judge people. Judge not lest you be judged. So wait a minute. Let me, let me get to this. must be a contradiction. Right, Robert? Contradiction. Bible contradicts itself. Look. Jesus said, Judge not lest you be judged. Although nobody could... Let's be honest. Most people that say that wouldn't even have a clue in the Bible where that is. Try it on people sometime. Ask them. Go ahead, ask them. Oh, yeah, you're right. It does say in the Bible. You know where it says that? Oh, no. I just know it says it. Oh, so you don't know where it says it, so you never read the verses right in front of it and behind it. You're just going to read the one verse that says, judge not, you be judged, right? That's what you're going to do? No, that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. Judge not based on your opinions. That's what he's talking about. Take the beam out of your own eye, bro, before you start throwing another. But righteous judgment, oh, God's all for that. He's all for that. And that's what Paul's talking about right here. He says, man, that you may abound in knowledge. And listen, 
Do you like how Paul says it? That you may bound in knowledge and in all judgment. But where is your judgment that you're going to cast down on people need to come from? It tells you. In knowledge. Knowledge of what? The Word of God. The Word of God. I was reading a post the other day. I mean, I, this is why I can't get on Facebook anymore. I'm just, I, I'm serious, man. Right, so I apologize if y'all, I apologize if y'all try to contact me on Facebook and I don't respond back. But then when I text you, you don't respond back to me. You know, there's a problem with that. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but listen, but listen, I'm on Facebook the other day. This, I don't know, this is like a week ago. And I'm reading this thing about how this lady was just going after people for going after uh, Dwayne Wade and his, uh, his wife there. Because they have a... a, a Gay son? Daughter? I can't remember. Gay something. I can't remember if it was a son or a daughter. Anybody remember? No? Okay. And they were, they, but they were going after this. Ah, this isn't the day we live in. You know, the kid's 14 years old, okay? And, and announced that they were gay at 10. How does a kid at 10 years old know their sexual orientation? Outside of, when you go to the bathroom, take a look down. That's your sexual orientation. That's the way God made you. Yeah. No, I identify with a man. No. You're not even a man. How could you identify with you? You're 10 years old. Come on, man. We ain't teaching our kids right. And then when we call something out like that, someone gets mad at us. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. I'm just telling you what God's word says. Oh, well, that, that's not judging you. That's telling you, hey, man. Your creator, you're offending him with what your actions are doing right now. And yeah, sure, there's actions that I'm doing that, that my creator I'm offending too, but that's not the issue right at the moment. Right now we're talking about your issue. Stop, stop turning the tables around and looking at mine. Because that's what we do. Do I feel charged up this morning? I kind of feel a little charged up. I hope what I'm saying is right. I feel like it is. Anybody else agree? Listen. Listen. That ye may approve things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Listen, maybe I'm calling out your sin and maybe you don't like it, but you know what? I don't answer to you. Yeah, that's right. I don't answer to you. You don't like it. But I'm going to love you enough to tell you anyways. Yeah. That ain't right. Now, I do agree how you say it does matter. I agree that you need to come in love. I think some of the way Christians go at people is ridiculous. That's not going to do nothing. That ain't going to help nobody. I think how you say it does matter. We shouldn't be calling them names. I could use some, right? But listen, that we may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled, there's that filled, with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus under the glory and praise of God. The end result is joy beyond what we can know in this life, superficially in the flesh. It is a natural, temporal joy that never brings happiness if you find or try to find it in the flesh. The problem is, way too many people try to find it in the flesh, and then they wonder why they can't find joy. Well, I'll tell you why you can't find joy, because you're too busy trying to find joy. In things. You ain't going to find joy in things. It ain't going to happen. You want joy? Live the abundant life. Then you'll find joy. Yeah. That's where it is. That's where it's at. There is an order. The fullness of God bears His fruit. Look at Colossians 1.9. I'm almost done. You can see that I'm almost done. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. Do you see what Paul's praying for? Paul didn't cease to pray for this. Maybe, Robert, that's what we need to do. Maybe me and you just need to get on the phone one day and for 12 hours, man, just without ceasing, pray that our people would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that we might walk worthy of the Lord. Y'all remember what I talked about last week in that walk? We're all on a walk. Question is, where are you walking to? Are you walking toward the promised land or are you just walking in circles in the wilderness? But we're all on a walk. Make no mistake. 
But we need to walk worthy because when we walk worthy, it's pleasing to the Lord. Y'all see that right there? Being fruitful in every good work. Y'all remember how, you get, how, 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 what, what, how we get fruit, right? Y'all remember what fruit does, right? John 15? Yeah? Brings glory to God, which is the purpose of the church. Yeah, you know, just a little, little tidbit there. What? We need to be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyness. We need to have knowledge of his will. Why? Because knowledge of his will is the starting point. And I would argue, I can't argue this church because I know we've taught it. But I could argue that most churches don't have a clue what the knowledge of his will is. They don't know what it is. They don't know that there's actually seven wills of God found in Scripture. Well, you can't do it if you don't know what it is. Right? Listen, by the way, the knowledge of his will, the starting point, guess what? That just happens to be Ephesians chapter 1 through 3. It's almost like God done wrote this book. And you want to know what's next? You want to know what's next? Is walking worthy of the Lord. And you want to know what that's all about? That's all about Ephesians chapter 4 through 6. Pretty good, right? Yep. Come on, guys. I'm almost done. Work with me. Yep. All right. Ray says, yep. Good. His fullness is found in Christ. Colossians 1.19 says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. So, class, where does all fullness dwell? Where does all fullness dwell? Come on, guys. You got to do better than this, man. All fullness dwells in Christ. So what did Paul just pray that for about us being all in all fullness in Christ? So how do we get all fullness in Christ in us? You better make sure you understand chapter number three. You better make sure you understand chapter number three. If we're going to do what Paul's praying would happen in us, we better make sure we understand chapter number three. In chapter number four, he's going to say this. Till we, now he's, he, and, and notice, okay, I don't have time to flesh this out, but we're almost in chapter four. Can you believe it? L listen, uh, next week we'll be done with chapter number three. Boom. Okay, listen, that was a funny laugh. There you go. Okay, uh, check it out, okay? Listen, when we get to chapter number four and he starts explaining to us how we can do what he's talking about right here, he's going to talk to us about why God gave pastors. Well, God gave me pastors so that he can, you know, come see me when I'm not feeling good. God gave me pastors so that I can tell him what to do. Right? I mean, some of the stuff that I've heard about what we, our expectations on pastors are, I don't even know where people get this stuff from because it ain't from the Bible. But, but let, me tell, let me just help you, though. But one of the biggest reasons why God gives us pastors is so that we would gain knowledge and understanding so that when a false doctrine comes along, we won't get pulled away by that false junk. Okay? That, 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 that's a good godly pastor who's been called. Listen, in verse 13 of Ephesians 4, he says, till we all come in the unity of the faith. How do we come in the unity of the faith, folks? Romans 10, 17. For faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I.E., Cheyenne, wherever you are, 1 Corinthians 1, 10. Oh, as long as we all agree on the essentials. Well, how are we all going to come to the unity of the faith with that? You teach this and we teach this. Those are two different things. I don't think we're all in the unity of the faith there. Call me, call me crazy. No! Paul, God, better yet, God is looking for us to be in unity under him. And the only way we can get in unity under him is we let this be the authority. That's it. It's the only way. And it better be the right one. Because there's only one right run. <laughs> okay? Listen. Unto a, why, why, why do we want to get unity of the faith? Why do we want to increase in our knowledge of the Son of God? Because when we are unified in the faith, that's why what I said earlier is so important. 
We're only as weak as our, or as strong as our weakest link. 1 Corinthians 12 is very important. It's very important because part of all of that's going to help not only us individually, but this church become a perfect man. Aren't we, aren't, aren't we one body? See, see, God's not just looking for individuals to mature. See, we're all part of his body. And he's looking for this body to mature. But y'all remember the examples I've given you, right? What if Deion Sanders broke his toe? I mean, he just got two, uh, two toes amputated. Could, could he do what he did at the level he did it with a broken toe? That one little small broken toe. Just a stupid small broken toe. Come on, it can't matter that much. Can it? Yeah, it can. I remember he had turf toe. He was on the Dallas Cowboys. And I remember he had turf toe. And he was out for 12 weeks. Out! The highest paid defensive back in the league. Out! Can't cover a thing! Because he had turf toe. The smallest schism could be bigger than we ever know. It could be give, bigger than we ever know. But what is the point of all this? Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Listen, guys. I'm done. I'm shutting the book. I'm shutting all books. I'm losing stuff. Listen. I'm just telling y'all, man. I'm just telling you this as, 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 as much as I can say it from a loving pastor's heart as I can say it. If we want to reach the fullness of the stature of Christ... We can, yes, yes, individually, we have that ability to do. And I think 2 Peter chapter 1 is right on display there. But no, do no. Let me say it this way. And I'm not trying to be that guy, but I am, because I always say that. So apparently I am. Uh, you know, me and Robert are going to be held accountable not just for our actions, but yours as well. You know that, right? Does everybody know that? You know that, right? That's why it's so, to me, and I know Robert, that's why it's so important to us. That's why we drive these points home as much as we do. Uh, number one, because we love you. We love you, and we know we have the same problems as you do. We ain't saying we're better than you. We got the same problems. But at the same time, we're going to be held accountable for it. See, you're not held accountable for me, but I'm held accountable for you. Fair, right? Right? That's fair. But you see, when you don't do what you're supposed to do, do you know that has an effect on me and Robert in eternity? Did you know that? Well, if you didn't, you should. And if you don't believe me, just go read Hebrews 13, 7 and 17, and then maybe you will. Listen, man. We got to want to have the full measure of Christ in us because it's available to us. God has given it to us. We can, we can never say that the worst swear word on planet earth. I'm sorry, the F word is not the worst one. It's bad, but it's not the worst one. The worst one is, as a Christian, is I can't. What do you mean you can't? Yes, you can. Just stop walking in the flesh. Start letting the Spirit take control. And then I promise you, you can. And not only you can, but you will. You will. We need to all have that attitude. Church cannot be coming together as a, a, as a church body, doing the things that we do together in the church. It cannot be a secondary thing. It can't. Jesus never thought it was secondary, did he? I don't think he did. I mean, if he thought it was secondary, would he die for it? Do you know what God the Father is going to do with this church one day? Anybody know? 
it's going to, he's going to present it as a love offering gift to his son. <laughs> just stop and think about that for a little while. Let that sink in just for a couple minutes. Because if that doesn't sink in, you're not paying attention to what I just said. Okay. You think I hammered him pretty good, Ray? Okay, you told me to, so I did. Hey, guys, I love you, man, honestly. And I ain't saying I don't have some of the same issues, man, because I do. Robert definitely does. I mean, dang. But we all do, man. We all got these. We all struggle. But we got to hold each other accountable. We got to love one another. We have to. We got to be better. We can be better. Christ is in us. Amen? Yeah. Come on, somebody else say amen beside Justin. <laughs> My gosh. <laughs> amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord. We just want to thank you for this day, for everything you do. Thank you for your word. Lord, I'm uh, grateful for the book of Ephesians. Uh, Lord, I hope that we all understand that uh, this is a lesson book for us. We need to learn what the church is truly to be. Uh, because we want to be what you called us to be. It's not about one Baptist church. It's not about what Pastor Robert or Pastor Frank thinks or Pastor Billy or anybody for that matter. It's about what you think. And Lord, we want this church to be a, a body that's, uh, that, that, that's sold out for you because you deserve that, Lord. You deserve nothing less. So Lord, I pray, Lord, if anybody thinks that I'm trying to be harsh or anything like that, Lord, uh, please forgive me. Please let them give me some long suffering and mercy and forgive me. I'm not trying to be. Just trying to be honest and, and, and upfront about things that I know that you're looking for, Lord, because I want us to be better. We can be better. So, Lord, we just ask that your spirit would be with us, uh, that we would just maybe search ourselves a little bit and just ask, what can we do better, Lord? What can we do better? If we could just be a little better tomorrow than we were today, we're, we're, we're heading in the right direction. So, Lord, I pray that we would do that. I pray that we would continue to be taking steps forward. And, Lord, we will give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name I pray. And all the church said, amen. amen.